Welcome to our special Facebook Live series called Expert Connections, where we are interviewing experts with information and insights to help us through this COVID-19 pandemic. When this is over and we fast forward and we look at ourselves in the future, what side of that are you going to be on? The person that showed up or the person that stayed on the sidelines? There are a lot of problems to solve right now. And that means that there's a lot of opportunities to do the thing that you're really good at. There are so many blessings that come with that through wisdom and creativity and a, a whole different perspective. So I'm confident that this whole experience is going to bring out some, some positive change for each of us as well. Good morning. Welcome to our special series called Expert Connections. I'm Julie Holton. I'm the founder and principal strategist of M Connections Marketing Agency. And I'm so glad you can join us this week for this series. We are bringing you round table style interviews every day as we talk about COVID-19, what it's been like during uh, this quarantine period, and as we start to return to finding what we're going to call today our next normals. Joining me today for a conversation about marketing, business development, and sales are two of my very favorite women in the industry. We have Sherry Pash. She is a membership and growth strategist. Um, you can find her at sherrypash.com. Sherry is very well known throughout the US and Canada, especially for her work with um, chambers of commerce and growing their membership base and really working on focusing on providing those resources and education and the necessary um, things that businesses need to thrive. So Sherry, thank you for joining me. Uh, thanks, Julie. Welcome. I I'm so excited to be here. So thanks for welcoming me in today. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time to join us. And also with us today is Stephanie Barnhill. She is our operations guru at M Connection. She is an operations, business operations consultant and all around just brilliant mind in, in business development and, and working. If you need someone to work with spreadsheets, Stephanie is your gal. And so, <laughs> Stephanie, we are so glad to have you join us today, too. Thank you so much, Julie, for having me. I'm so excited to share with you ladies today. And for those of you who are tuning in, give us a thumbs up. Let us know you can hear us and, and see us OK. We're so glad to have you joining us, too. Feel free to join the conversation with us this morning. We're really looking forward to some of the topics that we've prepared for you. But we know there are a lot of questions and, and plenty of, of directions where we can take this conversation. So feel free at any time, um, drop a comment or a question. And if you have additional insights to offer, we'd love to hear that, too. So. All right, ladies, let's get started. So we, um, Sherry, you and I, you joined me weeks and weeks ago, back when all of this was first starting. I think we were in maybe the first week or two of the stay at home order here in Michigan, where we are located. Um, gosh, how much has changed between then and now? I think if you had told us then that we would still be at home right now, um, it might have taken a different turn on the conversation. Um, so let's let's talk. Let's start by talking about so much has changed in the business world. Um, we we know this. We hear all this talk about finding our new normal. Um, actually, Sherry, I really like how you were this finding our next normal because we know this is definitely a period of transition. And so, one of the things that. Um, that we need to do as we find this next normal is relook at um, what we call our client personas, our buyer personas, and and really in layman's terms, it's it's our ideal client or our ideal member. So as we start to look at um, kind of revamping this client persona, the first thing I want to ask you, Sherry, is why is this so important? Why do we need to look at our buyer persona? Because right now we're going to be coming out of a time that, that's unheard of for our business, right? So we need to understand our market segments, our client segments, segments, those personas, so that we know when we're looking now to rebuild and recover, what is that going to look like? We have to know if what I recommend is looking at a market or client segment, <clears throat> talking about what percent of your business has been coming from that segment? Um, these are kind of the things that are going to create this persona or this profile for you. And again, this is kind of for the, that corporate client customer. We can do the same thing with membership as well, though. Um, but really, this one is, is very clear for that. Define the type of client that makes up this market segment. Because right now, we need to know if we need short-term business right now, you need some, you need new business to, to get you through this. You need long-term business. Do you 
you need a lot of smaller clients and customers that are going to generate a lot of revenue? Or do you need one or two big clients? But we need to know who that is then and where they're at so we can go right away to that. So we want to make this, this profile, and you're going to talk about the market segment or whatever you call your segments, basically. Define who makes that up. What does that look like? Um, where do you find that type of a client or customer? What type of business or revenue do they produce or represent? That's really important. And what's their buy pattern? Will they book short-term business with you? Will they sign contracts a year out? How, does the, how do they buy, basically? And then what's the average price rate they'll tolerate? If you need a lot of large money right now, which we all, you know, everyone does right now, what does that look like? Or again, can you use those smaller clients to add up? And what's the status of this particular segment that you're talking about? So when you get back to business right now or you're trying to rebuild, you can actually say, I need short-term business that can sign new contracts now or can buy my product now or my service or needs my service. You can go to your segments, lay out these profiles or personas and determine based on the rates they'll pay, the um, how they book and buy, and you can make a decision on what that client call is going to look like. Because we don't have time just to call everybody in our CRM right now. We've got to be very specific to the segment that is going to give you the biggest return on your work right now for what you need. Does that make sense, ladies? Absolutely. So and first of all, for those who, who are tuning in and you're thinking like, wait a minute, persona, what is this persona that we're talking about? The persona is very simply, it is your ideal client. And you might have, you, you typically will have multiple personas that you look at, you know, and you look at these personas on the sales end, as Sherry's talking about, you look at them on the marketing end. Um, and, and all of this comes together. And we just shared in the comments, if you um, are looking at a buyer persona, here's an example. So we just shared one with you in the comments. You can, you can take a look at that link later. Um, Sherry, one of the things that's come up multiple times with our clients is, well, I know who my, my ideal buyer is. Um, and the reality is your ideal client or customer has changed. Maybe that person is still your ideal person that you're going to target. But think about in your personal life, in your business life, how much has changed since the start of the COVID pandemic. All of those things have changed for your persona as well. And so it's really important right now to walk through this exercise. For instance, maybe your ideal client before you used to connect with them at networking events. That was, they were at trade shows. That was where you connected, you made those. I mean, there are a lot of businesses that, that relied on, I say relied past tense, Hopefully that'll come back. But a lot of businesses that have relied on historically on trade shows, for instance, um, mm -hmm. what happens now if those trade shows aren't happening or if you're not able to go to in-person events, you have to look at where that your persona, your ideal client has not changed. Do you still want to connect with that client? But where you connect with that client has changed. How that client is conducting business has changed. And so I think right now, one of the things that people aren't talking about enough is, is conducting this client persona exercise all over again for every single client. And it may not be super time consuming, but Sherry, wouldn't you agree that we really have to look at each, each client persona and rethink about how COVID-19 has changed their habits and then how we need to adjust our habits to still be able to connect with them. Exactly. And the thing is too, that top client that you had may have gone through such a financial hardship that your personas of a certain industry or type of business that was very strong for your company or for your organization, or if you have sponsors, investors, that money may not be available anymore in your A client may have just changed. So it's really key to rework those personas based on today's reality of revenues, on staffing. They may not even have salespeople that are going to events anymore for you to meet and talk you know, sales to sales. So it is really important now to sit down and look at these personas or profiles of your individual industries, market segments, because it, it has all changed. Um, you know, there's familiarity there for you still, for sure, but it's time to update those and make sure you're doing business with who you need and want to do business with. And even those people who were your top clients before, if they are struggling, how can you be that, that aid for them right now? How can you help them recover and come back? Do you have a product or service or just your personal relationship that can still add value? We have to remember, it's not all just coming right down to business. You're not top for me anymore, but how can you help them 
recover and be a part of it. It's all about what we're giving back right now as well. So absolutely, they may, not, they may not be able to be there for you right now, but they'll be there for you another day when they recover. What a great point to talk about the values that you have as an organization, mm -hmm. that those values need to be, be reflected in how you're conducting your business. I love that, Sherry. And I think it's really important twofold what you've said. So I'm just going to repeat this because one, you've said you need to prioritize your personas. You need to look at maybe your A's and your B's. Where is there going to be that short term turnaround to help you generate cash flow and then maybe the long term growth? Um, so those have changed. And also, I love what you just said about, okay, even if someone has kind of moved from your A team to your B team, you still need to look at how you're providing value as well. Um, Stephanie, I want to um, turn and talk to you now about developing. So we're talking about our external personas. We're talking about how as an organization we're um, communicating and doing business um, with our clients. I think this persona is also an interesting thing to talk about internally. So a lot of the work you do is really looking at um, culture, looking at structure. So what would you say, Stephanie, is um, like how, how do we need to look from maybe a persona perspective at our teams as we're managing our teams in this return to the office? Yeah, and that's a great question, Julie. I, here, the the one that of, of course is probably most at the forefront for a lot of people and actually it is for me uh, for sure but we have learned that employees can be productive in a work from home environment and that that's kind of shocking news i think to a lot of companies out there i think the old butts and seats uh <laughs> kind of you know unless you're sitting there at your desk uh, you know, in the office, then you're not being productive or you're not, you know, you're not doing your job, if you will. That's right out the door now. Uh, you know, this, this, you know, and it's a fact that many companies have acknowledged um, being able to be productive remotely uh, from home. Um, and they've been benefiting from, uh, you know, since well before COVID. I take our company, take M Connections. You know, um, this is we were a virtual agency since day one, well before the pandemic hit. Um, so generally speaking, people should be able to determine the best space for them to be creative, to be productive and engaged with work um, as much as possible anyway. Um, allowing, and dare I say encouraging, employees to continue to work from home is a great option for many companies and their employees, you know, not only now, but in the future, even once, you know, things have settled down a bit. Um, Right now, also, you know, right now, companies need to be very thoughtful and flexible when planning to bring staff back into an office space. Um, I would just, you know, recommend to to have increased safety measures at the building and within the actual office environment, um, whatever that looks like for for the particular uh, company. Following all of the recommended guidelines, you know, for your industry, for your for your area. Um, but some employees may be at high risk for, for COVID-19, or they might have people in their immediate family or that they're providing care for that are high risk and, and are concerned about being in close proximity to other people right now. And it makes sense. Um, so I think making sure that employees have their own space in the office, making sure that you're following all protocol and guidelines, that you're communicating that effectively. Um, social distancing from others within the office is gonna be vital. Um, there's also the mental health you know, concerns of someone trying to thrive and be productive when they don't feel safe. So if someone returns to the office, they're trying to work, but they just you know, keep having this anxiety and fears of being, um, you know, getting sick or, or spreading something that they, you know, that they feel they you know, might be at risk for, um, then it's gonna, it's gonna really impact their, their being able to enjoy their work, being able to thrive, being able to be productive. So again, allowing people to work remotely or, or from a safe place for them um, can be really helpful moving forward to the best of, of the company's abilities. Um, I just think companies needing to just really need to strive to be as flexible as possible in shift scheduling, you know, whatever that looks like for, for that industry, for their industry, transparent about the needs and concerns of the company while also sharing their gratitude for their staff. So employees need to feel safe, but they also need to feel valuable. Um, and when people feel valuable and when they feel safe and they're, they feel like they're being heard and they're understood and they're their, their safety and health is, is priority for their company, um, then the trust and loyalty for the company builds and then productivity goes way up. Oh, so many, so you packed so many really important points into that, Stephanie. Um, let's unpack a little bit of that because I really yeah. love what you were saying so much. Um, one of the things you said that I wanna emphasize first is we're talking about people. 
and um, and people are our most important assets. Sherry, yeah. I know you say that. Stephanie, we we all know this. Okay, so but we're also business um, minded. Um, we we own businesses. We we get it. Um, we we always want to put people over profits, but profits are important, right? Another P word I'll throw out there is productivity. Um, yes. People are more productive when they feel safe, when they feel secure, when they feel valued. These are things that we know. Science tells us these things. Um, our bottom line tells us these things. It's something that we know at M Connections as a virtual agency that our people are very productive working in their own environments on their own schedule. Um, yes. So we were doing it before it was cool. We yeah. like to say. <laughs> So, um, so, so important to talk about that. Um, but one thing that, so Stephanie, you and, and another member of our team, Amanda, worked on a blog that just came out. It's on our website today. Um, we haven't even promoted it yet, so you can get your first look at mconnections.com. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that, that we kind of inserted into this blog is this idea, um, and maybe this is kind of an unpopular idea, but I'm just going to throw it out there because we are on Facebook right now, after all. Um, yeah. Put your politics aside. Put your opinions aside. Um, if you are a leader in a business or an organization and you have a team that looks to you for your leadership, it doesn't matter what your personal opinions are about wearing masks, um, whether you're for them or against them, right? Like either way, our, our job as business leaders is to follow the regulations that, that get put out to our businesses. And I think that as leaders, we have a responsibility to make sure that our team feels safe, that our team feels that, hey, you know, one way or another, like we're going to follow these guidelines. We're going to make sure that um, that you're safe. We care about you. We care about you going home to your families at night if you're in an office situation, um, that we care about how you're interacting, if you're interacting with our clients. We care about our client safety. I mean, all of those messages are so vitally important right now. Yeah. And, and maybe because of social media, we see a lot of the divide, the divisiveness. It can be very polarizing. But I really think that at the end of the day, Put your politics aside, put your opinions aside, and look at what the rules are that we have to follow to get our businesses back up and running or back open to the public and set that good precedent, set that, be that role model for our teams. Stephanie, I really love too, you talked about mental health. And we won't get fully into all of that, but you can look back at our interview from yesterday. We had two incredible mental health experts talking about this. And the reality uh, of this pandemic and the mental health status is this. Even for those of us who feel, for the most part, pretty good on a daily basis, every single one of us is going through stress, heightened stress, heightened anxiety, heightened worry, um, some more than others. But that's something that I really think the business world needs to talk about because it's vitally important when we talk about bringing our people back to work um, or back to the office. People, our, our people have been working. Um, but it's one of those things that you know we also need to keep in mind when we're interacting with our clients, with our customers. How are they doing? It's not just about making the sale. And Sherry, you said that so eloquently when you were talking about the personas. It's showing that value even if they're not your number one customer right now from a business perspective. So Stephanie, you really made some some incredible points there that I think are are so important. And also, hey, if you're a numbers person, at the end of the day, your numbers are going to be better. People are more productive when they're happy and they're healthy and they feel valued. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're healthy, you're not missing work. You're not, you know, having to go to the doctor's office as much. You're not, uh, you know, suffering from from pain, um, likely not suffering from pain. So you're in the office more, you're productive more. It just is better all around for everyone. <laughs> and productivity, we know, translates into providing better products and services. Again, when our team is performing, um, we're able to um, to provide better products and services for our clients, which makes for a better business. Sherry, there's been a lot of talk about finding our new normal. I love your phrase, our next normal. Um, tell us about those next normals, especially in sales and business development. Um, we know that, for, for instance, right now, face-to-face -face meetings are out. Um, so where do you find prospects? 
You know, it's funny you said that, that right. The new normal is what we're in right now during COVID. I, in, in the past, we're not going to see again, at least not for a long time. And so that next normal is how, what's our next way of doing business? And that's exactly right. To find those prospects, we're going to use some of this data that we've been talking about, using those personas to find out first, who do we want as a group, as a DNA, if you want to call it? What's the makeup? of who we want to add to our prospect list. And then when we start to look at that, look at our lead sources in the past. What worked to bring us those types of clients? If it was events and it was networking, we know we have to do some digital events and digital networking and some other ways that we're gonna do that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we know if we need short-term revenue, go to those personas. So truly to target the ideal DNA, you have to understand what you're looking for before you get them to your prospect. But once you know who it is, there's a couple tools. One, LinkedIn. You all know I love LinkedIn. In fact, on June 9, I'll be doing another LinkedIn training, so be sure to go to my website and sign up for that. Um, but now we've got to look at how we digitally get in front of people. We've got to hang out where they're hanging out. And if that ideal client is in LinkedIn, because that's that executive level, if you're looking for that, or if they're hanging on Instagram, but wherever they're hanging out, you've got to hang out with them. You also have to be able to truly be able to sell your relationship with them through phone, through what we're doing today, um, vir vir virtually. I, I work with a lot of people who say, I'm just not techie. And unfortunately, we have, as you can see what we're working through today, we have to all become techie in order to really move into this virtual world that we're in right now. Another tool I'd like to mention, if you are looking for prospects and you know your DNA, there's a free tool out there that many people do not use. It's called Reference USA. I don't know if any of you ladies have heard of this, but it's free through your library. If your library does not have the tool, go to a library and keep looking online till you find one that has it under business resources, and then it's free. You can put into this, this database, which is very accurate, um, the size company you want, the, re the revenues you want that company to have, their credit rating. Um, you can put in, um, I forget what I just said, how, how long you've been in business. Uh, there's like 40 or 50 things of criteria different geographic locations. Anyway, you can find some amazing prospects through this tool, then use that tool and put those names in your LinkedIn to see, okay, now that I've got a company, let me look them up on LinkedIn and build the relationship with a person at that company. Now I can see that this company, I can learn who they really are as people because of what they're talking about on their insights within their LinkedIn company page. Now I see the CEO or the VP I wanna connect with. I don't just connect with them maybe on LinkedIn, but I might now use this as a source for rapport building through a phone call or email and then go back into social media. So a lot of different steps they can do, but I feel those two tools together make an amazing ability to virtually build a prospect list. I didn't get to walk into that networking event, but I got to go into Reference USA and find 10 new companies to digitally build relationship with. And some people will say, I don't want, you know, should I let people on LinkedIn know I'm looking at them? When you went to those, those events, you didn't wear a paper sack over your head. You walked into network and shake hands. So shake hands with your LinkedIn profile now. And that's what we mm -hmm. want to be doing more of. So that's how we can still, we can still find new clients and customers. Also keep your brand, which is what Julie is such an expert in. Keep your brand strong out there so they come find you as well. You want people inquiring, looking for you. And that's where I'm on the sales side, Julie and Stephanie are that marketing side that really help you know who and how and how they're going to find you through some of that marketing brand. Sherry, I love when you talk about LinkedIn because every time you talk about it, I learn something new about prospecting because it's a, it's a different, LinkedIn is such an incredible resource for us in so many ways. And when you're using it for marketing, you're using it in a totally different way than you are when you're prospecting. Yeah. And I'm just going to emphasize, I did not hear you say that you should just start um, spamming everyone on LinkedIn with your cold call type sales no. message. You're, you're talking about using it as a tool to start building a relationship which is so right. important because right. oh my gosh the other way just does not work <laughs> no it's kind of like a telemarketer at that point it's like no we're using linkedin to pull data out i want to know the companies and the people i now want to begin a relationship selling experience with 
Oh, and Sherry, you mentioned that you have an upcoming on June 9th, I believe. You yes. have um, at 10 a.m. You have a LinkedIn training session. I I just put the link, the events link um, there. Oh, thank you. I'll have to update that later to help it make sense. But it, that's the direct link to sign up for that that oh. training. And I, I highly recommend it because um, Sherry could talk all day about LinkedIn, but I we're not going to water. Um, <laughs> but such a great tool. And Sherry, I love how, you know, really the point is to start thinking outside of the box. I mean, we, we We've had right. you know more than two months now of this um, as we're adjusting right. to this next normal. We know, I mean, there's very little that we know long term, but we know enough right. to know that we're not getting back to normal anytime soon. So yes. now is the time to really start making these adjustments and, and to see mm -hmm. creatively how we continue to connect with prospects. And I really love um, that our, that idea. Um, you and one thing I can add real quick, Julie, is that it's especially when we used to go out on sales calls, you could look at the person's office. You could see their you know, face more. You could build rapport building pieces just from what you saw walking into their office building. Where now, how do you find that rapport building? And you've got to use this social media tool to learn what's important to this person, what's their personality, and use some of these tools when you're warming that call up so there's no cold calls. You've got it warmed up by what you've learned through their LinkedIn profile or, or if there are other social media too. So. Oh, Sherry, that, you know, that's a topic for another day. I think we could yeah. do a whole segment on that. I mean, we talk about like the disc analysis and assessing people's yes. personalities. Um, how do we do that now in a virtual world? Um, and think about it before the pandemic, um, we would we would get to know our clients or our prospects. Do they prefer emails or phone calls or yes. social media or texts? Um, mm -hmm. Now we're limited even more. We're not just bumping right. into them, rubbing elbows. So um, it really does change and force us. Like you said, um, you, we can't use not being tech savvy as an excuse anymore. It, we no. have to get up to speed. We have to learn. Um, for some of you whose kiddos are at home from school, oh. they can teach you. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, my six-year-old nephew taught my my mom how to you know set up a Zoom account. So we can yeah. you know learn from who you've got. <laughs> and you know, and Julie, you said a good point about the disc. There's some things you can so easily do. Like if you see somebody talking with their hands, talking fast, you know, I'm fast paced, high energy. I need to pre I need to talk to them in regards to a, a sales relationship or experience in energy, in fun, in yeah. activity. Don't just give me a bunch of data and details. I need those and I love those, but I live on this fun and excitement piece. So you've got to be able to read your, and how do you read them with just a couple questions in your head when you don't get to even see them maybe, you can still tell by the, the conversation and the words they use and things. So I think that could be a really fun session. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get that one on yeah. the books. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanna watch that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. You know, Sherry, a lot of the things you're talking about is adaptability, um, mm -hmm. being a flexibility. You know, some of these key words that businesses really need to look at and adjust and change with the times. Stephanie, I, I want to ask you about this. Um, could there be... Uh, and I, I hate to, uh, sometimes I hate to to use this cliche, but it's so true. Could there be a bit of a silver lining in some of this as far as um, giving people the push, business leaders the push? And let me actually, I'm gonna jump back, as, as you nod your head, I'm gonna jump back to a comment from someone you know very well. <laughs> um, Seth says, work from home can be the new normal, absolutely. Flexibility with employee work from home practices should definitely continue with companies that can allow it. And Seth was actually one of our guests several weeks ago. Um, Seth works, um, uh, he's a, a creative director at a, at a marketing and ad advertising agency. And I know Seth has been a big proponent of work from home and flexibility. Um, Stephanie, do you think this could be the silver lining that really starts to push businesses to, to make some of these changes? Oh, I think so. And I hope so. <laughs> it's a great question. And it's, it's something that we've been thinking about a lot, um, just for if in my own home, um, thinking a lot about in, in these next steps. I mean, I think that companies are given, if there is a silver lining, and I, and I, and I think that this is certainly one, companies have been given the, the perhaps uncomfortable opportunity to really quickly get their tech up, up in current, you know, like, okay, now we have to have a Zoom account or, or, or some other conferencing account. And Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And oh, now we have on our resumes now. Exactly. It's this whole new skill set, right, that we're building and, and getting the, the hardware too. Okay. Now we got to have a tablet and a computer for this person or that staff member. So 
I think that we've done what we've kind of, a lot of companies have done what it takes to kind of, you know, get set up, you know, at least short term. But I think there would be huge benefit in allowing people to work remotely moving forward, at least in some capacity. And there's going to be people watching this that are like, but I don't like to work from home. I, I'm ready. I, I want to get back. I'm extroverted. I, I really love getting together with my group and brainstorming. And that's a beautiful thing. And hopefully someday safely, you know, we, we can get you there. But also, um, there are lots of people that you know would rather not commute and, and drive an hour into work every day, you know, if they don't have to, or if their work is can be done, you know, safely. But also, just you know, they can be productive and creative from home or another place that's in their own community. If they if they do have to travel for work, um, then then let them, you know, like encourage that because that's going to be better for the employee. They're going to have time back in their day, less money on gas and fuel for their cars. Right. And, you know, I think that if companies got really uh, kind of innovative, they could say, OK, there's these two days a week or one day a week where no one comes in the office you know, unless unless absolutely necessary, because that saves an overhead. fees. If you if you can take two days a week and not turn the lights on not turn the heat on or the AC on, you know, or, or, or not have to pay other staff to be in office, you know, or security guards, things like that, where they can, you know, they can monitor a different part of the building. Um, then that's saving the company overhead costs. And those really do add up. So there are benefits to allowing people to be more flexible and to, you know, work on your schedules a bit and, and let people kind of live their best life, you know, which also means they, they can live their best work life too. So I think that that's, there's a lot of benefit coming. M Connections, I just want to say again, you know, I think that companies, you know, we want companies want to to be able to serve their clients, their prospects, their customers in the community to the best of their ability. And, and with them connections, Julie, this is something that you took on immediately. You know, when when all of this this pandemic started, you know, you saw that there were people, businesses in the community and outside of the community that really needed um, consult. They needed to hear from other professionals and experts. So, you know, Julie got, uh, you know, the expert connections, what we're doing right this second, up and running at a time that was so crucial. I mean, talk about being innovative and, and and ready to to take take everything on when people needed it the most and and clearly they still need it i mean we've gotten so much positive feedback and testimonials about how helpful these expert connections have been for people and for businesses and they continue to be so i think the more we become innovative and forward thinking then the more we're going to continue to move in that direction you know companies of all size and in all industries and it's going to better them it's going to better the community it's going to better the employees and staff I just see it as a win-win as long as we take on that responsibility and we maintain it and continue to work to improve it. It's always always about taking the negative and turning it into the positive. And I love how you talked about looking at innovative ideas. Um, you know, when we look at at the recession, we look back at 2008, and we talked about this in a previous Expert Connection series. When you look back at what was happening during that recession, we saw the birth of companies like um, like Uber, um, Airbnb. Yeah. And so when you look, it's it's I think, um, of course, we're focusing on our own businesses right now. But it's also interesting, I think, to think about what's being born that we don't know about yet. What's mm -hmm. happening right now that's going to change our world for the better in the long term. You know, as you talk about innovative companies too, Stephanie, I think some of the businesses that have been and, um, thriving right now are those that were very forward looking to begin with, that were looking ahead and willing to kind of step out of the mold and try something new. Um, one great example would be a client of ours, GRA Benefits Group, um, and their ability to actually right now during this time provide insurance agents with an online accessible portal, you know, an online benefit admin system and, you know, to, to cut paper out of the equation. And when we think about going paperless now, it, it has a, a different um, connotation to it when you think about COVID-19 and you think about, you know, protecting ourselves and safety and, and not being able to be in the office or not being able to sit down face to face. Who wants to print off a 90 page report for a meeting when you can have access online, um, especially when that meeting is virtual? And how do you get those papers to the people that are in the meeting. So I think um, some of these really innovative ideas um, are really being pushed to the forefront right now out of necessity. So it's something for us as businesses to be thinking about what, how do we change our policies? What policies need to be changed? What things could we or should we be doing within our businesses to be more accessible and to allow for this flexibility? Um, 
Absolutely. And so talking about kind of digital, um, Sherry, as we're focused virtually right now, as we're looking at um, um, everything digital, I mean, we're, we're talking yeah. right now virtually. We're using, right. a, you know, an internet where some of us are, Stephanie's on her hotspot. I'm on yeah. Wi-Fi. I think Sherry keeps going back and forth between the two. <laughs> so we're definitely in this, in this virtual yeah. world right now. Um, let's talk about CRM because I know that that is yeah. something, Sherry, when it comes to you, collecting data and um and then being able to use so there's one thing to collect the data that's right to be able to use it so from a sales perspective um let's let's shift and talk about crm what data should we be collecting and then how in the world are we going to use it yeah that's the thing so many people will collect data and that when at conferences i'll ask about that and nobody's using it though so it's one thing we've got to collect the right data and then we've got to give ourselves permission to take time and have a strategy session with our own team and pull data out and, and let it direct your strategy for the next quarter or the next year so the things i'm talking about are things like lead source right now can you run a report for your own business your own work that tells you the lead source of all your new clients or accounts whatever you call that for your new revenue what was the lead source for those? How did they find you? How did it come to you? Because that's what you want to do more of, what's bringing you the great new revenue that you have, the new clients or customers, and how do you do more of that instead of spending time and resources over here on things that aren't giving you the biggest return. So lead source data, no matter what system you're using, you've got to have a data field with lead source and make your, your choices drop down boxes as much as possible. When you leave it to open text, your team, is, they can all be entering different things. CRMs are as important for a, a small one or two person per operation as they are for a large corporation for two different reasons. A large corporation, you've got to know what everybody's working on with these particular clients and customers. You need to see the journey, the conversations that are happening. And it'd been a small business like myself, a one person show, I can't keep track of every person I work with and every client and every conference. I have to have a CRM just like you ladies to give us the data we need. So things to collect, lead source, referral source. Did this come referred to you by a person? So again, you can run your referral sources to see who do you need to be doing some thank yous to because those good um, customer and clients are coming their way. Um, fiscal year, wouldn't it be great to know if, not for everybody I know, but for a lot of us, when does your client or customer's new money start? When do you need to make sure you're getting in their budget for that next um, investment you would like? Some people's money start July 1. And if that's the case, if we're not in their budget right in this period right here when the budgets are being approved, you may miss out for the whole next year until the next um, July. So knowing uh, fiscal year is really important. Their buy pattern, put that in there. Do they buy year round? Do they buy certain times of the year, certain quarters of the year? Um, when can they? So again, if you need money right now, you could easily run through your CRM. Who spends their money now? Who signs contracts now? So again, some people buy regularly. All It depends on your product or service, you know, and if it's um, a continuous one. Uh, prospect and client levels, again, tied to your personas. Your quality levels, If I'm hoping you, you track those. If you don't, I recommend. Who are your A, your B, and your C level customers and clients? So when you are looking to really do some, some innovative work, I'm going to run the types of clients, customers, or prospects I want. So we'll talk about that again in a second. Your buy factors, reasons that they invest with you, the reason they buy your product or service. So again, when you run a report and see all those reasons, you know, am I offering enough benefit and value for the reasons people are doing business with us? How can I continue to enhance that and grow that? Um, follow up and next steps. All of that should be in your CRM with custom fields, user-defined fields, whatever you, your system calls it. But your relationship journey has to be in that CRM because you're not going to remember that their daughter broke her leg in soccer three months ago. When you go to talk to that person, you want to use that personal data um, to, to keep that relationship strong. Or if anyone else in your company or organization is getting ready to call that customer or client, you want them to talk that. Like, that customer is so important to you. You all talk about them and, and care about them. So it's a great tool for the relationship, but the data is huge. Anything that you need as criteria to measure, put it into your software system. Put it into a field that you can query from. And then give yourself that permission to query from it and actually to use it to guide. If I'm going to look, get ready to do new strategies for sales or new places to find prospects, I want to know how many of them came through LinkedIn. How many came through Reference USA? How many came through um, social media? 
and I know where, again, I'm going to put my big push on right now. I hope that helps a little bit. CRMs, I'm really passionate about. You, I've used them for decades. Every team I've worked with through my career um, and in my own business now, it's been, a, it's been a measurement of success for that person is how well they use the CRM. Yeah, it's it's such a great point, Sherry. I, I, I love it and I, I love your shared enthusiasm with CRM because I, I share that with you a hundred percent. Um, you know, and, and and you on you know this the the sales side especially and and with me it's a lot of the operations organizational side you know one of the things that i use ours for that's so helpful is having a pipeline built into the crm um and and i know that that's some that some have some don't i mean with crms you can have all the bells and whistles and you can have just your, your bare minimum whatever is best for for you for the company but um you know we actually uh you know our project flow and in our our, uh, our our client flow through our pipeline is all done within the CRM and it's it's a one-stop shop. It helps us make sure that we're staying, you know, on top of all of our proposals and our contracts and, mm -hmm. and we're reaching out to the people that we need to reach out with in the right amount of time. And and so just as a as an organizational and operational tool, it's incredibly beneficial. And just also having everything in one spot, having all your contacts in one spot, having all mm -hmm. of your clients and prospects in one spot is so helpful, especially when it comes to you know marketing, email marketing and things like that. So it's 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 a wonderful tool. Yeah, and I love what you said, Stephanie, about tracking your it's your forecast. It's your watching your deals, if that's what your system calls it, or it's watching the revenues grow. What's prospect? What's tentative? What stage of the cycle are they in? So there's that entire operational side that is so important. So your CRM is data for strategy. It's it's relationship, and it's your operations. If, yeah. if you don't have one, um, email any one of us and we can recommend some. I know some that are very, very affordable for small business, those that are huge with the bells and whistles. So, But if you don't have one, you've, it's a, a key tool, especially during this time of regrowth and rebuilding right now. Start fresh with a new CRM if you yeah. don't have one. Talking about CRM really, I think, brings together this point that sales and business development and marketing all need to work together hand in hand. One is not successful without the other, and you need the system. You need you need the data to look at it all to keep it to keep it flowing. Because I'll inject that marketing. We so we use our CRM in so many ways operationally, as Stephanie described. We use it as Sherry described in, in kind of our sales process, our pipeline. Um, great example is we just we um, we just brought on a new client this week. Um, whose spouse is actually someone who's been in our pipeline for about a year now, I think, and just someone that we've been, we've established a relationship with about a year ago. And, you know, I mean, Sherry, you know that the sales process is not, mm -hmm. they're not always looking for it right then and there. Right. That doesn't mean they're not a prospect or that they're not a good prospect or a referral source in this case. Mm -hmm. And so you want a way to be able to track, you want to be able to nurture that lead, um, foster that relationship and, and work that through the pipeline. Now on the marketing side of things, oh my gosh, like we, you know, what is our marketing without um, measurement systems and benchmarks? And our CRM is an exceptional way to be able to track all of that and continue to foster that growth. So we we focus on a system called inbound marketing. And the whole idea both of you have described, which is, is really just attracting those leads, nurturing those leads, working them through the pipeline. Part of that is just I'll give an example from our own business. There's so many different forms of marketing, right? So if someone is really interested in social media marketing, I may not want to be sending them high level technical emails about DIY SEO. Um, it's a lot of letters, DIY SEO. Um, they're not going to want to hear about search engine optimization if they're really focused on um, building their Instagram platform. And what are they going to do? They're going to unsubscribe. They're going to they're going to pull away. They're going to feel like M Connections is not relevant to my business or to what I'm doing. That is the last thing we want because we also provide Instagram, right? We we provide that marketing. We so it, and it kind of take this example for your own business. You don't want to be sending the wrong messages or mixed messages or lose a prospect because they feel that you are not connected. You do not understand their business. Um, that defeats the purpose of everything we've been talking about today as we talk about building these relationships and connecting and, and building our prospects. So definitely from a marketing perspective, um, nurturing those leads and being able to use that big data, use that CRM, um, 
to our full advantage. And uh, just real quick, one thing on that, Julie, just you, you triggered me real quick. I'm going to jump in there. Um, is that you want to be able to pull that that member or client record up in your CRM? You're calling them, or they're they've called in. You want to pull that up and be able to see this data. What's important to them? Instagram or some high tech thing they're looking to do? Is it important to them for what product or service you offer? So immediately your conversation is relevant and it looks like you know exactly who you're talking to. When you have hundreds yes. or thousands of customers and clients, you have to have that data. So make sure it's in an easy to use format. You can pull it up as you're, as you're answering the phone or calling out and you literally have the information you want to use in that relationship right away. So important, Sherry. I'm glad that you, that you brought that up. Um, and I know you gave the example of, you know, if your client has a daughter who broke her leg, yeah. um, you want to remember that. And we're busy people. And so it might it might not be that you've forgotten or don't or that you don't care. I mean, of course you care. But, you know, you've got so much going on. Have a place where you can keep track of this. You can you can check in. You know the ups and downs um, mm -hmm. because you know especially right now with COVID brain, um, mm -hmm. we talked about that yesterday just with the stress and trying to keep everything straight. We can feel like we're in a time warp, and so use that of course um, to your advantage to be able to keep track of these things. Sherry, another really great tool. And you are the queen of this. Um, I feel like I, even though this is an amazing marketing tool, I always think, oh, I need to, I need to be like Sherry when it comes to this. Another great tool is using testimonials. Um, yeah. Tell us, how do you use testimonials um, as a as a as a marketing and business development tool? Yeah, yeah. Testimonials. When you think about it, before we do anything, before we download an app, before we purchase most about most anything anymore, we we purchase we read reviews, right? So we want to make sure that your clients and customers and prospects especially can read reviews about your work, your product, your service. And so having those testimonials, um, I do firmly believe that when you send an email to a prospect especially, you need to have an, uh, a testimonial under your, your signature or right in the body of the email that is talking to that particular prospect. Either it their company looks like this company, they're going to use a product or service that you offer that you know this this prospect would have an interest in, and they're, the testimonial is talking about that. So you want to make sure that basically you're matching testimonials to the person you're emailing and put those right in there. Because if you're looking to get a sales appointment, a phone call appointment, you know, that's what we can hope for now. We can't hope for those in person. But you want a phone appointment with someone. That that testimonial may get you that appointment more than anything you've written about your company or what you do. So we want to definitely use those. So as you gather those, it's a, it, a lot of people go, how do you get testimonials? You know, I hate asking for them. We all in our business day get emails or phone calls where someone's complimenting. Oh, you guys saved my life with that last post or that for you guys marketing wise. Or, oh my gosh, I met so many people when I attended your virtual networking the other day. Or, you know, I saved so much money using your insurance program. So whatever the thing is you're getting there, you want to turn that around and kind of, um, don't change the wording, but make it read like a testimonial. Email it back to them and say, would you be comfortable if I was to, to, to really use what the words you've shared as a testimonial to help other businesses have the same success you found? Or, you know, that they I'll promote your company while I use your name in all my different emails and on my website and in my social media. Um, a lot of my, my chambers will do something like that because it's really important, that exposure. So basically, a voicemail, uh, email, turn it around and send them their words back. Most people are going to be so pleased that you want to use their words and they didn't have to do the work of rewriting a testimonial for you. They've Beautiful already shared example. it. Yeah. Yes, you already so, did the hard work. And yes. Yes, I, I have to say, we actually have an example of when you gave a testimonial about Chambers of Commerce, you yes. unsolicited, you 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 sent them, you, you posted something, and they were actually able to turn that around. And it was something, so your testimonial can also help generate new business. So exactly. think about that, you know, give some, get some, right? That's right. You <laughs> and make sure we're giving that praise. Yeah, if there's somebody, you know, one of your clients are struggling, see if giving a testimonial would add value to them or not. That's just something easy we can do. You can collect those again through your LinkedIn recommendations or just through emails. And But it's a strategy. Have a testimonial strategy for your company or your organization. What are you doing with testimonials? Using them in, like put them on a Word document by category. Get those into your, your, your client and customer emails as well as get them in social media. We're so blessed to work with people like this. 
those and show what they said about you. Put them into your website, of course, all those normal things we've done, but put them in the emails too. get using them. And my only tip to add is when you think about it, do it. <laughs> because yes. yeah. uh, Carrie's the queen of getting testimonials. I am the queen of thinking about it. And then <laughs> weeks later, thinking about it again and remembering that I never did it. So, right. And we want to do it when about it's yeah. hot. Yes. 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 And, and you'll see if you go to my website, there's a whole tab for just testimonials because I, I can tell you what I can do for your business or company and I, and I can talk about it. But it's going to mean a whole lot more when you can read people who are just like you, what they've experienced. So the same thing for all of your products and services out there. Get those, that feedback and share it. Use it, as your, use it as a sales tool. It's my, my strongest sales tool. My only sales tool almost are testimonials. Well, and too, it makes sense. I mean, think about what we buy online now. I mean, we, I don't think any of us buy anything without reading the reviews and seeing how many stars it gets. You know? That's so, right. It really is vital. It's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Sarah, you do such a great job with it. I've seen your testimonials and they are fantastic. And so wow, helpful. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I hope they're helpful. And I know that on here we have a lot of small businesses. So you can use those too. If you don't have that online presence and we all I know are going, get into those stores and all. How do you use those testimonials on your social media, on your Facebook page? You know, a lot of uh, smaller businesses use that Facebook page. Like we might use our websites or, or those online stores and such. A local business, you can do just as much with testimonials through your social media, which is so impactful. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can actually share that review link from Facebook, for example, um, from Google reviews. You can share that direct link in that email that you're sending to your client yeah. um, to give them easy access to just write their testimonial right in there, um, yeah. which is great. Um, this has been such an incredible conversation this morning. Um, we've had a lot of feedback. Um, thanking you both for your expertise. Um, audience, if you have any questions before we go, I've got one more question I'm going to ask. So that'll give you some time to go ahead and use the comment box if you have any comments or questions for Stephanie or Sherry or myself. Um, you know, Stephanie, before we wrap up, I want to I want to turn back to you again because um, at the very beginning we were talking, you were talking about internal operations and internal communication. And um, we know, all of us as business leaders, that we're not going to get everything right. <laughs> we know that's actually maybe what makes us a leader is knowing that and, and having transparency and honesty in that. Um, whether it's internally with our teams or externally with our clients, you know, we're going to give it our best, but we're not always going to get it right. Um, Stephanie, what's your closing advice for business leaders? Again, as we really work through, navigate through finding our next normals from this COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, good question. So I think, you know, the, 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 take, the take home for me, really, when it comes down to what we've been experiencing and looking at these next steps with businesses, uh, you know, reopening or bringing people back to, to the office, is really the importance of communication, effective communication. So, uh, and 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 that starts with leadership, right? So having having communication that brings people together, that's uh, you know transparent, that's honest, that's reassuring from leadership within companies is absolutely vital. Um, you know, I, you you can look at a lot. I mean, it depends on your industry and your company, how much should you be communicating? How should you be communicating? I think video is always really nice um, uh, when possible. Um, so all of that is gonna kind of depend a little bit about, uh, you know, on each company. But as long as, again, honest, transparent, reassuring, as uplifting to, to the best of your ability, um, you want people to feel as good as they can in a really uncomfortable and and stressful situation that that we're all experiencing right now on some level, um, so I think that that's paramount. That staff need to feel valued and appreciated, like we talked about, especially in a time of crisis, um, as as we also go through this personally too, and, and trying to figure out to predict and prepare uh, for what life is going to be looking like in the days and weeks and months ahead. So um, communication should also be unifying, including language that is based on company values. So whatever your company values are, whatever your company mission is, making sure that those communications are, are bringing that and aligning with that so it, it is authentic um, and meaningful and, and um, inspiring for your staff. Julie, as you said earlier, keep politics out of it, for my goodness. I mean, I think there's so much of that going on right now for companies and families and, and kind of everywhere. We can't escape it, right? So take 
take, you know, whatever your particular as a leader political opinions are, put those aside and look at how you can best represent and model positive unifying behavior for your for your staff because staff and employees and contractors, they look to you, they look to the leaders to figure out to to just like children look to adults. I mean, not not to, you know, make the one is, you know, more adult than the other. It's it's not that comparison. It's looking up to see who should I be looking up to as my model? Who should I be looking to for reassurance? Who should I be looking to when I have needs that come up, uh, you know, for for certain, you know, uh, work work related needs that come up and and you have questions and and you need a reassurance and you need to talk through benefits and HR, all of these things need to be uh, really led with a lot of grace, with a lot of reassurance, with a lot of transparency. So all of that makes a lot of sense when it comes down to just being there for your staff, being there for your employees, um, even when it's tough, even when you don't want to, even when it's scary, even when, you know, there might be layoffs. I mean, just, you know, everything that you can to really keep people unified to the best of your ability. Um, I believe that if a company can create and encourage a culture of compassion, and teamwork, um, chances are that company is going to get through all this a lot better and easier than companies that don't. Uh, don't don't put out messages and communications of alarm uh, or dissatisfaction or disregard for employees or just be absent. You know, just pulling back altogether. Now is the time when you have this incredible and important opportunity to step forward, to lean in, to wrap your arms around um, figuratively, and to really make sure that you're being the kind of leader that leads with integrity that you can be. So that way people not only are, are who are working for you are happier and healthier and more productive, but so that from the outside, people uh, can understand that your mission and your purpose as a company is authentic and real. And that's that at the end of the day, that can be a make or break um, and a saving grace for a lot of companies right now. So inspirational, Stephanie, and and something that again we we don't always get right, but we certainly you know we try yeah. with our team. And and yeah. I always say if for better or worse, um, I'm transparent. And one of the things we were talking about yeah. yesterday when we were focusing on mental health, um, which which ties into what you were just saying, is you know we said to our team very early on, hey, if you need a day, if you need a week, if you need yeah. an hour, you know whatever you need, you don't even need to tell us why. Just let us know that you need time, and we'll make adjustments because we understand that every day is changing. We have people who have children at home. They're not going to be going back to school. We have, you know, so many different layers of complexities that everyone is dealing with um, personally and, and professionally that um, if we can lead with that transparency and with that open communication, and again, be careful about HR boundaries. We don't, you know, you don't need to report to us what's going on with your mental health and, and that kind of thing. Um, our goal has been, and this may not work for everyone, but our goal has been to create a safe space so that people feel comfortable if they want to share. Um, our, our Tuesday bullpen meetings every Tuesday morning, we, we start by um, you know just checking in. How's everyone doing? What's going on in your lives? Um, and again, um, <laughs> you both also know that I'm still very busy. I'm, I, let's all right. Let's let's get it out and let's get down to business. Let's you know we start our business meetings with let, let's get all of that extra stuff out of our brains so that then we can focus on what we need to because at the end of the day we still need to serve our clients and we need to help them through this. And so if you're not at your A game, then I am here for you. But I'm also going to take you off and put you on the bench until you're feeling better. So come back tomorrow. Let's see how, how you're doing. But I think just really taking that approach and valuing our people is going to help all of us as we move through this recovery. Um, you know, Sherry, we were just talking about just the open lines of communication and any final thoughts. I think that might also translate as we're working with our clients and our prospects. Yeah, it definitely does. Which I was listening to you, and I'm going. So much of that would be exactly how you'd be dealing with your clients as well, having that empathy, being authentic. And I think that's a lot of it is realizing that they're trying to find their way. Yes, you're trying to get back to your sales because everyone in sales is that's how they earn their money. But we have to have that empathy of what they're going through and be transparent on what this has done to your own business and your own company as you're talking with your clients. So really everything Stephanie was talking about, how you would go with employees, you want to do that same thing with your clients. Now it all depends on where your relationship is um, with your customers and clients. But if you are very relational with them, that transparency is so important. And everybody right now is going to appreciate that. When you build that relationship so that they feel they can be transparent with you also. 
and very authentic with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Such a great point. Mm -hmm. Sherry, thank you so much for joining us today. SherryPash.com is the best way to connect directly with Sherry. Um, you can email her at Sherry at SherryPash.com. You can message her here on, on Facebook, um, mm -hmm. but SherryPash.com. And, and also um, check out that LinkedIn um, event that she's hosting June 9th. That, that's in the comments here. So Sherry, thank you so much. Oh, thank um, you, Julie. Stephanie, thank you to you as well. Mconnections.com. You can connect with Stephanie and I there directly. You can connect with our team. Um, we've shared a couple blogs. Um, I really love the, the title. We finally came up with this most recent one, Returning to the Office, Four Tips to Take Back Our Roaring Twenties. Um, <laughs> has this been a roaring start to, to uh, 2020? <laughs> that is great, no you guys. I, thank you both too. And thank you, Julie, for hosting these events and for including me. And I love having that chance to share. And I learn something from you ladies every time we're together. So oh. uh, love the time together. Me too. And thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you, Julie, so much for, for hosting this and, and for doing such a great job and bringing such beautiful insight for all of us. So it's wonderful to get to be with you two ladies on this wonderful Wednesday. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, funny you should mention our Expert Connection series and just how wonderful it is, Stephanie, because <laughs> tomorrow we have another roundtable interview. We will have three attorneys from Foster Swift Law Firm. They have been just incredible this entire pandemic. Um, I think we've interviewed gosh, maybe five or six attorneys in total at this point. So um, love when we can get those legal insights um, and get our questions answered. Um, they've been so gracious giving their, their time and their insights to us. So you'll want to join us tomorrow. We're going to have three attorneys from three different practice areas talking about a, a range of topics. So come prepared with your questions. If you have questions about um, the PPP loan forgiveness, if you have questions about employment law, as you um, maybe are preparing to get your um, staff back into the office, if you have questions about business contracts made before the pandemic, during the pandemic, um, you name it, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. So thanks to Foster Swift for that. That'll be tomorrow at 11 a.m. And a quick plug for Friday. We've got one more interview, um, one more roundtable style panel on Friday. Ladies, you're going to love this. We have two business um, strategists who are going to join us. They work in different capacities here in the greater Lansing area, um, working with businesses of all sizes. So we're going to just really kind of have a brainstorming session and talk about what are they seeing that's working um, what's working better than maybe other strategies right now and what do they what do they see coming as we look down the road and how businesses should be adjusting so it should be a really interesting conversation there too so thank you again both of you for joining us thanks to all of you if you have questions as you're watching the replay feel free to go ahead and ask ask those questions. We keep up with the comments. So, um, so feel free to connect with any of us and we will see you back here tomorrow morning at 11. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.